Hey, welcome back, ladies and gents. Nice to see you. Listen, as a reminder, the Department of Real Estate will be testing you on seven categories. What I want to do today is I want to focus on just one, and that one is, drum roll please, yeah, practice. First one is the MLS. The term, the MLS, what is it? Ready? Here it comes. The MLS stands for the Multiple Listing Service. The MLS stands for the Multiple Listing Service. Get that through your thick skull. I want you to know that forever and ever and what? Yeah, ever. Multiple Listing Service. So what is it? Listen, nice and simple. The Multiple Listing Service is a database of houses. It's where us agents, all agents, go into this database and we place all of our listings, all of our houses that are for sale in this database. And what happens is this, nice and simple. All buyer's agents, all buyer's agents looking for property to purchase for their clients, for their buyers, they go into this database of houses that are for sale. Nice and simple. So what's the MLS all about? Well, it provides us two pieces of beautiful information, man. Piece of information number one, it gives us information on the homes. Nice and simple. Prices of the homes, photos of the homes, info on the square footage of the homes. Everything you need to know on the house will typically be on the MLS. Got it? Nice and simple. The second thing that it provides us as realtors it provides us the information as to how much commission I will earn if I sell this listing. If I bring a buyer and we purchase this listing right here, this listing, this house for sale, how much am I as a buyer's agent gonna earn? It's right there in black and white. It's listed on the MLS. That's beautiful. It's all disclosed. Disclosed information of the house, disclosed commission for any cooperating broker who's involved in the transaction. Got it? Good. MLS, it's a fantastic tool. Now, the next term I want you to know is CAR. C-A-R, CAR. Ready, what does it stand for? Here we go. California Association of Realtors. Nice and simple. California Association of Realtors, what is it? It's an association that involves realtors. Here, where? In the state of California. What else do you want me to tell you? Pump the brakes, it gets a little bit more in depth. Not too much. CAR. When you join a brokerage, they typically want you to join the local real estate board. It's very common. Your brokerage typically will want you to join the local real estate board. Now, when you join that local real estate board, you'll have access to classes, trainings, a lot of presentations from those who are involved in the real estate field. Take advantage of that. Another advantage when you sign up with your local real estate board is you become a member of CAR, the California Association of Realtors. And that's crucial because that's where we get all of our forms from, all of our documents, all of our, all of our contracts, the contracts. I'm talking the RLA residential listing agreement. I'm talking the RPA, residential purchase agreement. I'm talking disclosures. I'm talking everything you need to close the deal is right there in the car forms. Got it? So the minute you become a member of the California Association of Realtors, guess what? Yeah, you have access to all those beautiful forms that you're going to need to succeed in this field, man. You got it? Now, if car is the California Association of Realtors, what could NAR possibly stand for? NAR, N-A-R. Well, NAR stands for the National Association of Realtors. And the National Association of Realtors has its own benefit as well. What kind of benefit? It's a designation. The minute you sign up for the local board, you're also gonna be a member of CAR, the California Association of Realtors, and the National Association of Realtors, which provides you the designation of realtor. You're not your average real estate agent, you're actually a realtor, and that's the difference. Now, NAR doesn't provide you with any forms. CAR does but it provides you with a nice designation. In fact, they're gonna provide you with a nice pen that you can put right here on your lapel, a nice R that says, I'm a realtor, and I have to what? Yeah, as a realtor, I have to abide by a high code of ethics, and that's the major difference between a realtor and a real estate agent. Next term, ready, here we go, drum roll please. All right, good, hey listen. When it comes to real estate, we don't want any type of discrimination. Hell no, we don't want discrimination whatsoever. So with that in mind, I want you to think of the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Now, what does that mean? In 1968, the Civil Rights Act included any type of discrimination when it comes to housing. When it comes to the broker and their principal, you can't discriminate whatsoever when it came to real estate. That's the Civil Rights Act of 1968. It prohibits any type of discrimination when it comes to race, religion, color, and national origin. No bueno amigo, you can't do it. Hey, the next term we're gonna go after is the word, the word fiduciary. What a nice word, fiduciary. F-I-D-U-C-I-A-R-Y, fiduciary. What does that mean? What does that mean? The word fiduciary comes from the 17th century Latin word, and it means to be loyal to somebody, to give allegiance to the person, particularly 
especially only to your principal. Now, what am I talking about? Listen, when you join a transaction, when you get involved in a real estate transaction, there's two people typically in the transaction. There's the principal, which is the person you represent, and the third party, the person you don't represent. They have representation from somebody else, from another real estate agent, from another realtor. Your fiduciary duties must and always be given to your principal. Now, yeah, you can be nice to the third party, but you gotta give your all. You gotta be loyal. You gotta provide full disclosure to all material facts on the property to your principal, to the person you're representing. Fiduciary, you owe it to them. Your allegiance, your trustworthiness, your loyalty, obedient, giving them information as to where all the monies are going. Disclose to them everything. Your principal deserves it. Now, here we go. We got a bonus one for you because this next term actually involves three terms, ready? We're gonna discuss type of agents out there. Type of agents in the real estate world. First type of agent I want you to know of is the listing agent. Nice and simple, the listing agent. Two words right there, listing agent. An agent who what? Represents the listing. Boom, they represent the seller. You got it? The listing agent represents the seller. And they owe their fiduciary duties to the seller. Not the buyer, to the seller. Got it? Listing agent represents who? Yeah, the seller and their property. Once a contract is signed, boom, all fiduciary duties go to that principal, that seller. Listing agent represents what? Yeah, the seller. Buyer's agent, it's right there in the words. Buyer's agent is an agent who represents who? Yeah, the buyer in the transaction. Their fiduciary duty goes straight to who? Yeah, the buyer. And in this case, the seller is the third party. Done. A buyer's agent, their principal is their buyer. Nice and simple, don't overcomplicate things. So, the third one I want you to know is the selling agent. The selling agent. So who's the selling agent? You ready, here it comes. The selling agent would sound like it would be the seller's agent. No, 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 no. The selling agent is the agent that brought the offer to the table. Think about that for a second. The selling agent is the one that brought the offer to the table, the one that represents the buyer. Could it be the buyer's agent? Absolutely. Could it be the seller's agent, the listing agent? Absolutely. The listing agent could get a buyer on that property also. Example would be if they do an open house. The listing agent, the seller's agent, does an open house. Buyer walks in and says, I'm interested. I want to buy this house. And the listing agent puts it together. He now represents the seller and the buyer. That's called dual agency. So the one that brings the buyer to the table is the selling agent. Although it sounds like it's the seller's agent, don't be fooled, it's not. It can be, but not necessarily. Let's move on. Ah, another beautiful term we're gonna discuss is FISBO. What the hell am I doing, am I stuttering? FISBO, FISBO, what the hell does FISBO mean? FISBO stands for F-S-B-O, FISBO. You try saying it now. Yeah, go ahead, I'll wait. Yeah, F-S-B-O. FISBO stands for for sale by owner. For sale by owner, just know that acronym means for sale by owner. Yeah, believe it or not, in the real estate world, there's some owners out there of properties who wanna sell their property without a real estate agent. Now why the hell would they wanna do that? They have their own reasons. They may wanna save commission. I don't know why they do that. I don't know why they wouldn't wanna have a true professional who knows the ins and outs of these contracts and disclosures, who can protect them at all times. I don't know why they wouldn't want that, but some people do. For sale by owner, what you can do as an agent is Go after them. If you see a sign in the front yard that says for sale by owner, if I were you, if you were smart, you'd contact your title representative. They'll give you every single detail of that property, who owns it, when they bought it, how much they owe, and you can approach that property. You can approach that owner as a warm, almost like a warm lead. You kind of know about them. They don't know about you, but you know about them. You can go up to that door, knock on it, or give them a call if you got that phone number. And say, hey, listen, let me, let me share with you the benefits of having a realtor. Let me provide you with all the ins and outs of what you can benefit from by hiring somebody like me. So, bottom line is this, FISBO, when it comes to your exam, stands for for sale by owner, and your job as a real estate agent is to, is to shine the light and let them know that it might be better, it might be best for them to hire you, somebody who can take care of them. All right, hey, listen, I'm getting a little tired. Let me take a quick sip of my drink here. In the meantime, what I want you to do is, if you like this video, go ahead and like, Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'd appreciate it. Let's get to the next one. 
SOI. Oh, mother of mercy, another acronym. We're full of acronyms today. I don't care. Here we go. The acronym is SOI. That stands for your sphere of influence. The people around you, people you know, people who like you, people who love you, people who might not like you or love you, but they might be willing to shop because they know you. They don't know your work ethic. So sphere of influence is a beautiful, beautiful opportunity for you to tell the people you know, whether it be close people, your family, or people who are distant, like the teachers at your kid's school, the mailman, the guy at the donut shop who has those great jelly donuts, all these people that you see often. These people are your sphere of influence and your job is to tell them that you are now in the real estate field with a brand new career. You gotta tell the whole world about it, especially those close to you. And that's called sphere of influence. Hey, bottom line is this, rule of thumb in my, in my book. If you, if you would consider sending them a Christmas card, put them on your database as sphere of influence possible prospects. That's what I would do. So, SOI, sphere of influence, let's get out of this one and move on. Hey listen, when it comes to the uh, practice category, you might get every now and then one or two finance terms in there. So I'm gonna share one with you. In fact, I'm gonna share two with you. And that's pre-approval versus pre-qualified. I want you to know that. Pre-approval versus pre-qualified. Got it? The difference is this. Pre-qualified, you got a buyer who walks into a lender's office. Lender looks at the buyer and says, hey buyer, possible buyer, how much do you make a year? And the borrower, buyer says, oh, I make, I don't know, $100,000 a year. Lender's impressed, lender says, wow, very good. You must have a very great job. How long you been there, Mr. Borrower? He says, oh, I've been there about 10 years. Oh, that's great. Next question I'll ask is maybe, um, how much do you have in your bank account? And the uh, buyer, borrower might say, oh, I got 10,000 bucks. So it gives them verbal information. Now, based on what you just told me, Mr. and Mrs. Borrower, you are qualified for a house of half a million bucks. Cool. Ready? But it means nothing. Now, why does it mean nothing? Because that information has not been, ready? Here comes the big keyword. Not been verified. It's not been verified. Now, when it has been verified, we're gonna go ahead and call that, we're gonna go ahead and call that pre-approval. Now, pre-approval letter is the lender saying, yeah, we verified all that you told us. You brought us bank statements. You brought us paycheck stubs. You brought us the, your last two years of taxes. Yeah, we believe you. We believe you, we verified. We contacted your employer. And he said, yeah, you have been there 10 years. Yeah, now based on this data that we have verified as a lender, we're a lot more comfortable and we're willing to give you a pre-approval letter. Whoa, so here's the kicker. Pre-approval means the world. It's the ticket to the dance. You're getting into the prom. Pre-qualified, don't let this guy in. Don't let this guy in, he means nothing to us. So you can't go in there and uh, do the dance. You can't go in there and boogaloo, man. So what you want is a pre-approval letter. Keyword here is verification. Got it? Something that's been verified. Your income, your assets, your job, it's all been verified. Pre-approval, yeah, we dig it. Pre-qualified, throw it in the trash, means nothing to me. I laugh at it. Let's go to the next one. Hey, here comes a combo for you. We're gonna go ahead and combine two and make it one. Ready? It's contracts. What kind of contracts? A contract you'll be using when you represent a buyer and a contract you'll be using when you represent a seller. Ready? When you represent a buyer, the contract you'll be using to make those offers on, RPA. Here we go again with these acronyms. RPA, what does it stand for? Residential Purchase Agreement, done. Got it? You see RPA, I want you to think of buyer. Keyword here is purchase. Residential purchase agreement. Residential purchase agreement. Let me say it one more time softly and slowly. Residential purchase agreement. Keyword here, purchase. Who does the purchasing? The buyer. Focus on the buyer when it's RPA done. Let's move on. When it comes to the seller, when it comes to the seller, we're gonna use the contract RLA. RLA, residential listing agreement. Keyword here is what? Yeah, listing. When it comes to listing, we're talking about the house, the contract with the house. And who owns this house? Yeah, the seller does. So when it comes to the RLA, residential listing agreement, I want you to focus on the seller. Hold on a minute, let's go down this rabbit hole. RLA. There's three I want you to know when it comes to listing agreements, to residential listing agreements. There's three I want you to be familiar with. The first one, ready, wait for it. The most popular one, the most common one, the one that you typically will be using is called the exclusive authorization and right to sell. Exclusive authorization or right to sell, you'll probably be using this 99.999% of the time. What does that mean? It means that you have been contracted, you've been employed by a seller, you'll be given an amount of time, whether it be three months, six months, a year, 
two weeks, it doesn't matter, as long as it's on a contract. They're giving you a window, an amount of time, a period, to sell their property. And if you do, you'll be earning a commission. Got it? Even if they bring you the buyer, even if they sit down with you one day to have a cup of coffee and they say, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Agent, I know I hired you, but guess what? I have a buyer who's interested. My buddy down in the, at my job says he wants to buy my house. I told him about it, he says, wow, you're selling your house, I'll take it. He wants to make us an offer. You as an agent are entitled to the commission. Although he found a buyer, it doesn't matter. Exclusive authorization and right to sell. You have the right to sell this property, no ifs, ands, or buts. Got it? Done. Number two type of contract when it comes to sellers. Exclusive agency. Don't be fooled by the word of exclusive. Exclusive agency. The only difference between exclusive agency and exclusive authorization and right to sell, ready, wait for it, this is a good one, is that when it comes to that same scenario that I just gave you, the seller goes to his job, and his buddy said, what, you're selling your house? I wanna buy it. And you sit down, for a cup of coffee with the seller, and the seller tells you, hey, guess what, I got Johnny, my buddy down at my shop, who wants to buy the property. I didn't use your services after all. Guess what, he's right. And you're not owed any commission. He did all the work, he brought the buyer. So, when it comes to exclusive agency, yeah, the seller's your competition. The seller can go out and find a buyer, and if he does, you're out of the picture. No bueno, amigo. So my recommendation, again, we go back to the exclusive authorization and right to sell. Use that one for your business. You have the right to do so. That's the only type of chips we sell in my store, sir. We don't sell exclusive agencies. We don't sell exclusive authorization and right to sell. You got it? One more type of residential listing I want you to be familiar with, and that's called an open listing. Got it? Now, when it comes to exclusive right to sell, and when it comes to exclusive agency, the word exclusivity comes to play, and that means we're exclusive. We're only going to be seeing each other. It's called a commitment. It's called being faithful to somebody. It's called it's you and me when it comes to selling this property. But when it comes to an open listing, I want you to think of an open relationship. Hey, I want to see other people, man. This is a seller saying, hey, listen, I'm not going to hire just one of you agents to find a buyer. I'm going to hire a whole bunch of you. And the first one that finds me a buyer gets paid. That's an open listing. That's an open listing. It's a seller saying, I'm going to hire all you buyer agents. Sign this contract, open listing, that you agree to it. I'm not committing to any one of you. In fact, it's called a unilateral contract. It's one person making a promise. And that one person making the promise is who? Yeah, the seller say, hey, I'll pay only the one that finds me a, a buyer. Hey, whoever finds my wallet, in this case, whoever finds me a buyer gets paid. That's unilateral contract. Got it? There's no contractual obligation from the buyer's agent. Hey, maybe I'll find you one, maybe I won't. I'm not all in either. Non-exclusive. Done. And now, for the grand finale, the big shebang. Here we go the earnest money deposit, or simply the deposit. Now when it comes to deposit, you already know this, when it comes to a deposit, it typically is a buyer, whether you're buying a house, a car, or any, a piece of furniture at a, at a store, when you say, here, here's a deposit, that deposit typically is going to what? Yeah, towards the purchase of the item, towards the purchase of the furniture, towards the purchase of the car, towards the purchase of a home. It's the buyer saying, here's my good faith money, man. I promise I'll be back. Here it is, I'm serious about buying this. I'm so serious about buying this, I want to give you upfront cash, a little bit of cash, a portion of the purchase price of the item, whether it be a piece of furniture, a car, or a house. Earnest money deposit. And that's what a buyer does when it comes to buying property. They typically, sit down, write an offer on the RPA, and say, I'm willing to give this seller in an escrow account an earnest money deposit, a deposit. Now this deposit, once we close this deal, of course, will go towards the purchase price. It's for me, the buyer. It's my way of saying I'm serious. I want this house so bad, I want to put some skin in the game right now from the get-go. Not sure the escrow department will hold it for us, but it's there, and it's got my name, the buyer's name written all over it. And again, when we're ready to close the deal, I want that, that money to go towards my purchase. Pump the brakes, not so fast. Now, since that money is sitting there, it's also utilized for the seller in case the buyer breaches the contract. If the buyer breaches the contract, the buyer decides to not purchase a property just because. And we're so far deep into this dog on the transaction, the seller's affected. The seller already hired movers. Hell, the seller already moved cross country early with the intention on this purchase being complete, being executed. 
a week before escrow closes. After all contingencies have been removed by the buyer, the buyer was 100% all in. The buyer decides, I don't want this house after all, Mr. Seller, I'm out. Seller says, hold on a minute, man. You've affected me financially. You've affected me financially. I've, I've then already paid a whole bunch of people to move my property from here to there. I took my house off the market. I could have had other offers. But because you strung me along for so, so long, I've lost all those opportunities. So because I lost opportunities with other buyers and I paid a whole bunch of costs to move all my stuff out of here, I think you, Mr. Buyer, who breached the contract, are responsible for all these costs. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and attack. I'm going to request some of that deposit that's in escrow. Now that's a whole different ball game. That's a whole different can of worms. But just so you know, when it comes to the earnest money deposit, it's there for the buyer's sake. Buyer says, hey, I intend on using this to close a deal at the end of the road. It's my way of saying I'm serious about purchasing this house, Mr. Seller. Look at what I'm doing. I'm putting anywhere from one to 3% of the purchase price into escrow. That's typically what the deposit amount is. House is a million bucks. I'm willing to put $10,000 in escrow. I'm willing to put $30,000 in escrow, one to 3%, which is the typical amount. Seller says, thank you, we appreciate that. We now believe you're serious by you putting so much money down. But if the buyer breaches the contract, it can get a little messy. Hey, listen, you're studying for the state exam. You're probably pulling the hair out of your head. Don't worry about it. Why? Because here at California Realty Training, we have a state exam crash course that you're gonna get tons out of. We also have state exam prep material that you're gonna find beneficial. The link is down below if you wanna access both of those. The state exam crash course, the state exam prep material, you can't go wrong. Hey, do me a favor, this next video is gonna help you out with that state exam. Take a look at it. We'll see you next week.